Count one, the murder of Rudy van Breda, the accused is found guilty. Count two, the murder of Martin van Breda, the accused is found guilty. Count three, the murder of Theresa van Breda, the accused is found guilty. Count four, the attempted murder of Maria van Breda, the accused is found guilty. Count five, defeating or obstructing the administration of justice, the accused is found guilty. That is the unanimous decision of this court. Hi guys, it's Tracy from Cape Town Etc. And I'm here with Kelly Phelps, who is a criminal law lecturer at UCT. And Kelly and I have done a number of videos together on Van Breda in the last few weeks. And as promised, we have now read the judgment. And um, I must say, Kelly, I really, really enjoyed reading the judgment. And being in court for 60 days, it's actually a really long period of time. I certainly didn't have the opportunity to go and revisit all the evidence myself. So that is what judge decided. I mean, he literally revisited all of the evidence. Yes, I actually found that quite a striking part of the day in court was the extent to which he really methodically went through absolutely every single piece of evidence that had been raised in the trial. It was almost like a mini version of replaying the trial again. Yeah. And one by one, he methodically struck out certainly all of the defense's arguments and reinforced each one of the state's arguments before reaching his verdict. Yeah. When he dealt with the point raised by the defense that Marley's DNA was not on the axe, he looked at that point holistically and he looked at other evidence that supported the fact that she probably was hit with the same axe. And that evidence was the fact that the wounds sustained by Marley were similar to the wounds sustained by the rest of the family members and that they were inflicted with the same force. And he said, look, it was highly unlikely that killers fortuitously came into the house, two of them. One of them used a weapon from within the house. The other one brought a weapon from outside the house, which just happened to be similar to the weapon they found in the house. And then the second attacker went upstairs and then attacked Murrily in very close proximity to where Teresa was attacked by the first attacker. Um, with the exact same force and intent. So when you start to look at those factors, which um, he, I, I felt that he dealt with quite well in his judgments, and I think that insofar as an appeal is concerned, it is actually going to be difficult to appeal on a point which I actually thought was quite strong for the defence. Mm. It, it's interesting because there's a few notable aspects to this. The first is the common sense approach that a court uses. And, you know, for example, when I teach my students, we speak about a common sense approach to reasoning. And sometimes people can struggle to understand what that looks like in practice. Mm -hmm. And what you've described there of Judge Desai's thought process at looking at all of the surrounding evidence in order to understand and take a stand with regard to the DNA evidence, that is what a common sense approach looks like. He's essentially saying, well, you know, let's be serious about this. Are we really trying to suggest that with all of the striking similarities in the wounds sustained by those family members, that a second person came in and attacked Marley with a second axe so close to her mother yeah. and in such quick succession. He's saying that just simply doesn't make sense and we will reject it. Yeah. And that's a common sense approach. Yeah. In terms of the length of the judgment and the detail he goes into, I think it's obvious that he's trying there to avoid or, or forestall an appeal being successful that essentially he's gone into so much detail with each piece of evidence and made his own reasoning so explicit in the judgment that the inference is it becomes far more difficult for a legal team to then suggest that there was some glaring error or omission in the way that he handled or approached the evidence in the case. There was talk of them running out of money and I'm pretty sure this conviction might actually make his financial situation worse if in terms of um, whoever's administering the estate or the trust. But there is another aspect which I think might um, support the fact that there will be an appeal and that is that 
Advocate Boita um, was, he, he really acted well for his client in this regard. I think he did his client um, a great service in raising those points. But do you think that Advocate Boita is perhaps going to act pro bono and, and see and file an appeal on that basis? Look, I think it's quite a common occurrence that an accused person will run out of money in a lengthy trial. And equally, it's quite common practice for the legal team to then continue representing them nonetheless pro bono. And oftentimes that's really an ethical question that you've, you've, you know, you've made this commitment to your client, you have such a detailed and inherent knowledge of all of the minutia and facts of a case that it would be significantly prejudicial to the client to have to start afresh. An added element to that in a high profile case like this as well is that you have been now associated with this case and there would perhaps be more motivation therefore to continue seeing the case through and follow to its full logical conclusion to the point of appeal. And I have no doubt that Advocate Berta would be the same in this case. I'm, I'm sure it was a bit of a knock to him, the kind of criticism that he got, but he is a seasoned professional and as you've said, he put on a very strong case in very difficult circumstances for this accused person and I have no doubt he'll apply the most professional standards to the next stages that are to follow. Reading the judgment, I thought either way, because of how complex this case was and that there would be an appeal from the state or the defence. After having read the judgment and how Judge Desai has dealt with um, the, the matter, I think he's actually made it very difficult for the defence to actually find grounds to appeal. Um, and moreover, one of the things that perhaps the audience doesn't understand is that if the defence does want to appeal, they actually need to ask Judge Desai for permission to appeal. Um, so wh what do you think on, on that basis, whether or not they do have grounds and on what grounds they would be able to appeal? So the state has far more limited options to appeal. They can only appeal on a question of law. So in other words, suggesting that the judge was incorrect on a question of law. They cannot appeal on the grounds of fact, that they disagree with the judge's evaluation of the actual facts in the case. The defense, however, can appeal on both grounds. So they can say either there was a problem with the law. Now, in this case, we haven't really been exposed to the judge's legal analysis very much yet because we know that this 150-page judgment that he read out in court and that has been circulated is actually only the summary of a far longer judgment, which is reported to be about 400 pages. And it's in that longer judgment, presumably, that his, illegal, his legal analysis will be housed because we haven't seen that in the summary. So we don't know they might have a question of his legal analysis, although Judge Desai is, of course, an extremely experienced judge, so it would be quite unusual. The other grounds that they could appeal on is that they could dispute his handling of the facts in the case. So they could say, look, you know, you looked at this fact, but you didn't understand the significance that it actually had in determining innocence or guilt. And that there might be another judge who would look at it differently and decide otherwise. And that's essentially the question that needs to be answered by the court is if another judge looked at this, could another judge reach a different outcome? And if the answer to that question is yes, then they must grant an appeal. In terms of process, the, if the defense, for example, chose to appeal, they would first apply to Judge Desai himself for what we call leave to appeal. And that actually means permission to appeal. So the appeal has two stages. There's the leave to appeal and there's the actual appeal hearing itself. If Judge Desai, if he says no, you know, he does not think another judge could possibly come to a different decision based on the evidence and therefore you can't appeal, they could then appeal directly to the Supreme Court of Appeal. Yeah, well, that would actually be interesting to, to ask Judge Desai um, for leave to appeal because, you know, one of his final points in his judgment was that this finding was inescapable. So for him to then consider um, an application for leave to appeal and, and give them permission, then I think that I, I think that's probably unlikely to happen. 
Yes, it's interesting because usually, as a standard matter of course, judges will err on the side of granting leave to appeal on their own judgments simply because it's good practice not to look too defensive or protectionist of your own judgment. And then actually it will be in your interests if they end up if agreeing with you. Agreeing. It strengthens your legal reasoning. Right at the beginning of the judgment, he reaches the finding, for example, mm -hmm that it is inconceivable, he says, that an intruder could have been in the house. Yeah, which meant that from that point, we sat all day in court. And really, within the first hour, I would say, we, we were quite certain that there was going to be a conviction. Yes, that statement alone made it impossible mm -hmm. for, for an acquittal yeah. to result. Because once that had been rejected, that there could have been an intruder in the house, essentially the defense's whole case fell away. But he was using words like inconceivable. Yeah. As you've pointed out, he says it's an inescapable inference yeah. of guilt in this case. On Monday after the judgment saw um, Henry being handcuffed and taken off to Polesmoor prison. But what preceded this was quite a hotly contested debate between whether or not his bail would be extended only for the two weeks um, that they asked for postponement to prepare for the sentencing. And the state did not want to extend his bail and, and they've placed a lot of importance on the interests of society. And then the defense also argued quite well that, well, he's been compliant, he's never been late for court, he's never ever um, infringed any bail conditions, there's no reason why he would now suddenly do it. They even said, why don't you put him under house arrest, we'd, we'd like time to prepare. What are your thoughts on the decision that Desai made to actually just send him off to, to prison? I think it's quite a harsh decision, um, practically speaking, because it does have a very big implication on uh, Henry's ability to prepare for his sentencing trial. So, for example, despite the fact that in Polsmore and all prisons, accused are meant to have access to their legal representation, it is unfortunately very common that an accused will struggle to have that kind of free access. Um, and there's also, I suppose, issues in having prepared, for example, with having uh, checked that there's sufficient medication for his condition, for his epilepsy condition. So it's quite, it was quite a harsh finding, especially in light of the fact that Berta actually offered, Advocate Berta offered, to have the condition placed on his bail, that he had to check in with authorities daily. Yes. Yeah. So that would have been very extreme house arrest conditions. Um, having said that, this case is unusual. It is quite an extraordinary case. I mean, it's really not every day of the week that someone gets convicted of such a heinous crime of, you know, brutally axing their entire family to death. So Desai is right. There, is, there, ha there must be strong consideration given to the interests of society. Um, nonetheless, Arguably, Advocate Berta would have said that the interests of society would have been met mm -hmm. by the fact that he would have had stringent conditions and that we're only really speaking about for two weeks. Yes, so yeah. it was really only to allow him to prepare for sentencing. It was never a question that he should be kept out of jail after his yeah, sentencing. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I would really like to thank Kelly for coming through and spending your valuable time with us and giving us your insight into this matter. And your expertise has really been valued to both myself and my team as well as our audience. And we appreciate that. So thank you for joining us today. Please look out for our next discussion on the sentencing.